Well, when my kids were little, I, I said a lot of stupid things. Uh, I, could, I could write books about the stupidity that came out of my mouth. But I don't ever remember saying this. I don't ever, I might have said it, but I don't remember saying this. When it came to schoolwork, when it came to uh, being involved with music or with sports, whatever they were into, I don't ever think I said, settle for less. That's good enough. I don't think I ever said that. You know, I do some wedding ceremonies, and here's this couple at the altar making the second most important decision of their life. And little do they know that they're going to face decades of morning breath, bed hair, if they still have it, uh, you know, uh, dirty diapers, tons of those, right? It's going to be a life, right? They're going to have all these arguments about whether or not they're going to watch the born infatuation or Mean Girls 10. You know, it's just going to be that way for them. But, but I don't ever remember saying to one of them or both of them, hey, for better or worse, settle for less. I don't ever think, you, that's not a place you want to settle for less. Many people do. But you don't want to settle for less in that decision. Now, in Paul's deci- uh, letter to the Col- to Colossian Christians, basically what he says to them in, in certain ways is, do not settle for less. He says that when you receive Christ as Lord, it's not Jesus plus. You know, there's, no, there's nothing more you need than Christ. As a matter of fact, he says it in verse 6, chapter 2. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. The big idea here is, if there's anything else that someone's trying to pin on Jesus with you, just say politely no. Because Jesus is enough. He's big enough for you. He's enough. But you know, all your Christian life, there will probably be people that come along that say, you know, there's a Jesus plus that you need to know about. And even longtime followers of Christ are susceptible to this Jesus plus type of thinking. Because maybe what happens is you hit a spiritual lull in your life where maybe you don't quite feel it the way you used to feel it, for instance, or maybe you're getting a little bored in your, in your walk with God for some reason. I don't know how you could, but we start to look for new experiences or new opportunities, thinking that that'll fill some bucket that is being drained somehow in our Christian life. So that's why I think Paul warns them and us in Colossians 2 not to settle for less than Jesus alone. And so here's what he says to, it goes on to say in verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive, that no one enslaves you or somehow pulls you away from Jesus through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental forces of this world rather than on Jesus Christ, on Christ. So I think what can happen is We can get captivated by lesser things that take us away from the real thing. All of us, I think, struggle at some level with this in our walk with God because we have this inborn tendency to want to have more than we have. There has to be more to this than just what I understand. Or maybe we're tempted to base our life on things that we think are going to fill the bucket, but then we find out really they had nothing to do with filling our bucket. So Paul unpacks for us some of the things that can captivate us and take us away from the Jesus-only life. And today I want to challenge you to consider that maybe somehow you could slip into these patterns or these lifestyles that will take you away from Jesus alone. So there's four of them that come out of this text. The first one is found in verses 16 and following. It's Jesus plus a lifestyle plan. Here's what he says. This is one example of this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or what you drink. Now, what's he talking about there? Now, there is certainly wisdom 
and there's biblical reasoning for us not to let food or any kind of drink take our lives over. As a matter of fact, the scripture clearly warns us against things like gluttony and alcohol abuse. The scripture is clear on that, that, that those things are not to be a part of our life. And I imagine that everyone here in this room can think of somebody in their life, maybe even yourself, who struggle at some level with controlling food habits or drinking situations in your life. Anybody not? I mean, most of us know someone, if it's not ourselves, who have issues there. But we do not define salvation or even a a person's walk with God by what they're struggling with in their life in areas like that. But this kind of thing was happening in the first century, and it happened in the Roman church too. There was a tension that grew up in the Roman church between the vegetarians and the carnivores. Now, just a show of hands in the room, and just be honest, are there any vegetarians in the room? Just any? Steve, I was at dinner with you last night. You're a carnivore to the core. Don't try to fool anyone here. Now, I, by the way, in a state where the motto is, where's the beef? I think that's kind of a stupid question to ask in a church service. But the fact is, Paul just says to these people in Rome, look, we don't define faith by those choices. Here's what he says, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 2 in Romans. One person believes it's all right to eat everything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't feel like certain foods should be ingested must not condemn those who do, because God, God has accepted them. The point is, don't make these a matter of fellowship. Don't, don't fall into these situations where it's Jesus plus some lifestyle decision. Now, there are entire denominations that center themselves around what you do or don't do, what you eat or don't drink. And they're more concerned, I think, about what's going into your stomach than what's coming out of your heart. As a matter of fact, Jesus dealt with this and talked about it in, um, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 and following. He says, anything you eat passes through the stomach and goes out into the sewer. In other words, what you devour is ultimately going to end up in the toity anyway. So it doesn't have very much importance to your, your total life, right? But the words you speak from the heart, that is what will defile you. For from the heart comes evil thoughts, things like murder, adultery, sexual immorality, lying, slander. These are what defile you, he says. So don't define the authenticity of any person's spirituality by things like what they eat and what they drink. Now, here's another thing he mentions. Jesus plus a worship style. A worship style. Don't let anyone judge you, he says, with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Now, what's he talking about here? Some people in their day were insisting that spirituality was tied to keeping certain religious experiences, certain holidays, celebrations, religious feasts, traditions of of worship. And people often judge then, and they still judge today, quite frankly, by how others worship God. Celebrations, of course, were a crucial part of their culture, just like they are in our culture. You know, one of the reasons we do the Heartland Celebration of Freedom is because we feel like it's it's a good celebration, and it's one that we should share with our community. But some of you grew up in churches where there were all kinds of religious holidays and ceremonies and seasons of observances. Nothing wrong with that. But, but, you know, oftentimes you could ask a person who's in that kind of a religious thing, why do you do that? And oftentimes they would say, you know, really, I don't know. And so you have to ask yourself, should you? Whole denominations and the Christian church in itself has divided over such things. Sometimes someone will ask me, why doesn't your church observe Lent? Now, I'm a kind of a wise guy at times, and so sometimes what I like to do is just say, do you want to see my belly button? I got Lent. I got lots of it. 
But that would be gross. And I'm not going to do that. So what I do, actually, I think it's a good question. I really do. I think it's a good question. And so usually what I'll ask is, well, why should we? And generally speaking, a pretty good answer comes out, something like, well, you know, I, I noticed that when we did this in the church I grew up in or the church I was involved with, that it really helped us to reset our priorities and focus on what's important. And I think, oh, that's good. You should do that. I mean, if that really helps you, you should do that. And then I usually also say something like this. You know, every day in the Christian life should be just like that. Every day should be a day where it's Jesus first. And so, you know, we try to live our lives that way too. You know, there are people who say that Christians need to worship on Sunday. I've had people throughout the course of my career in ministry say things that, you know, we can't have communion unless it's on Sunday. And their thinking is because the scripture says on the first day of the week, they came together and they broke bread, which it does say that in Acts chapter 22. But I usually remind them, you know, the Bible also says this, that Jesus observed the Lord's Supper when? What day? Thursday. And it also says in Acts that the church came together daily and broke bread together in their homes. And so why do we make a rule about this from one passage of Scripture when many passages talk about this issue? In Christ, every day is the Lord's day in Christ. People often judged and still judge others' faith by how they worship, how they pursue God. They insist on some form of prayer that has to happen in every service or some style of music that seems to resonate with them and so others should accept that too. Some type of preaching, some method of Bible study that they like and they think is important, some type of church service that they've become accustomed to and they like. But when a tradition moves from being something that helps point me toward God to some non-negotiable that everybody around me needs to accept too, that's when it becomes what Paul is warning the church about here. It becomes something that is Jesus plus something else. And we won't do that here with God's help. Don't let anyone take you captive, he says, with this kind of Jesus plus a worship style plan. Now, Here's a third way that we can be taken captive and settle for less than the best. It's, it's a fascinating area. It's one I've been confronted with over the course of my ministry career. Maybe you are too in your life. It's the, it's the Jesus versus a supernatural experience plan or Jesus plus supernatural experience. Here's what he says, verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, that's the key here. Put that right there in the back of your recesses, humility. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they've seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. Now, what's he talking about there? He's talking about this idea that, that a person has special revelation from God and it gives them a leg up on the rest of us. Now, there's something attractive about this, by the way. Somebody who is, you know, in tune with the unseen spiritual things of life. And we do know that there is a spiritual realm in this universe that, quite frankly, most of us do not understand very well. But when someone comes up and says, you know what, I've just been hearing from God on this. I just believe God is moving me. And, you know, they have these terminology about, you know, how God is doing something special with them. They have a pipeline to God. They're seeing special visions. And yet you read in that there's this false humility. That's the key. He says in verse 19, that type of person, that person with the special anointing, the secret things that God's revealing to them, and they sound, they sound like they're being prideful in it. He says, they have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God has them grow, as God helps them to grow. What does he say? He's saying, look, Jesus is enough, 
And so here's what happens. And I, I see this happen, and it, it, maybe you see it, maybe you experience it. So what happens is we start to get bored with our Christian life. And somebody says, you know what, I just, I just need another feeling to come up. I need some spiritual event to occur in my life that will give me new energy because I don't have the same kind of energy spiritually I used to have. And so maybe they start hopping from one church to another, looking to fill this elusive spiritual bucket that seems to be empty right now. Or maybe someone goes on a power trip and say, you know, God's just been showing me this and revealing this to me. God told me this. God shows me this. And then they use it to manipulate other people. It happens all the time. A number of years ago, a person came to my office. I, I didn't know them. They don't go to our church. I don't know if they'd ever been to our church, to be honest. But they showed up and they want to talk to the pastor. That's me. And so uh, met this person. And, uh, and she said, I just need you to know that God gave me a vision about you and your ministry. He's given me a special anointing that I need to share with you about your church. So, okay, let's hear about that. Well, you know, if God's speaking, we better listen. And so she proceeded to tell me some things about me and about the church that could not be from God. And the reason I knew they could not be from God is because they were anti-biblical. The Bible did not support them. And so we prayed together. The only time we should ever be 100% certain that God is speaking directly to us is if it comes from the Bible. All other times, and I mean all other times, regardless of how good the moment feels, how emotional you are in that moment, whether it's a mountaintop experience where you're just sure that God has opened up the pathway of his his voice to you, I don't care what it is, especially when everything in your soul is screaming at you, this must be from God. I am just saying to you, look at the scriptures. Look at the scriptures and make sure the scriptures align with whatever's happening in your life. Always take whatever information, whatever prompting, whatever anointing, whatever leading you think is coming from you or some other person that's telling you about you with skepticism. And look at the word of God. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. You know who you're most deceptive relationship is with? It's with you. Don't believe your heart. Believe his. One of the things I love about our church is I think we have many people who are in tune with the Holy Spirit and who follow the Word of God. But I do think that we need to be very cautious about using terms with each other like, well, God has revealed to me. You know, God has given me a vision for you. God has shown me because that's manipulative. We are to treat one another with love and encourage one another. That's what we're to do, to encourage one another with love. Don't settle for less than that. Now, here's a fourth hollow practice, very deceptive, and the plan involves Jesus plus keeping rules. And here's how Paul describes it in verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world... Why, as though you belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, we talked about that earlier, are based merely on human commands and teachings. What's he talking about here? He's talking about something called legalism. Now, somebody has a great definition for legalism that I nabbed onto. A legalist is a person who is afraid that someone, somewhere, somehow is having a good time. That's a legalist. Paul addresses this issue, this idea that it's Jesus plus following rules on how we gain salvation. But people have done this over the centuries. They say, you know what, I just think this is a great way for me to live. This works for me, so I'm going to make rules about it, and I'm going to make everybody else follow suit. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to do it my way. Legalists are the spiritual descendants of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are a group of people who knew the Scriptures in Jesus' day better than anyone else. 
They knew their Bibles inside and out. They were the most rigid religious people in their day. They made following the rules that they'd made up more important than loving people. And that's what Jesus called them out for. They led the masses in crucifying Jesus because Jesus loved people and he took them away from religion and they didn't like that. And so even since that day, there have been people who have been using rules and religion to manipulate and control people. Maybe you've experienced this in your life. I grew up in a church, not very legalistic, church much like this one, but they had their rules. I went to a Bible college that had some legalistic rules. On top of the list was playing cards, dancing, drinking alcohol was a no-no. Dancing is tab taboo for some Christians because, well, we know what dancing will lead to, right? We know what it can lead to. And so, I don't know, in our Bible college, where I went to college, we didn't have dances. We had hay rack rides. <laughs> what? You know what can happen underneath a blanket at a hay rack ride? <laughs> much more dangerous, much more iffy than a, than a dance. Ever hear the old joke, why do Baptists object, object so strongly to premarital sex? Because it might lead to dancing, that's why. <laughs> I've had more former Baptists come up to me this, today and talk to me than the last 20 years. I don't know why, I can't figure it out. Some of the most vicious people in the church are those who impose meaningless rules on other people. Things that go far beyond anything Jesus asks of us. Jesus told this powerful story in Luke chapter 18 about a Pharisee who comes up to the temple and, uh, and he scans over the, the crowd of people gathering and there's a tax collector and the Pharisee utters up this prayer. He says, oh, thank God. Thank God I'm not like that, like that tax collector and these other sinners here. Thank you, God, that I'm not like that. We need to be very careful not to fall into that kind of thinking. God, I thank you that I'm not like these, you fill in the blank, these people. It's so subtle. It's kind of accidental. None of us intend to become Pharisees. It's kind of like none of us intend to eat at Taco Bell. We just, we just end up there. It's something weird about it, but we be like our last choice. Well, when, how do we get to Taco Bell? The same way we can become Pharisees. We just kind of end up there. Let me ask you this. Who's on your thank God I'm not like them list? Is there anybody? I mean, I was thinking about this. You know, in this country, there's a lot of people who live green. You know, they recycle. Uh, they they want to save the planet. Thank goodness we have people who care about our planet. Hope you're one of them. But, but you could be tempted to look down your nose on those who aren't just living it out fully, you know. I just came from Colorado last week. There's a lot of live green people there. And you kind of sense from some of them this judgmentalism about, about others. You know, if you spend a fanatical time studying the Bible and digging into the deep truths of God without serving other people, you might be tempted to look down on people who, who don't know the Bible as well as you do. And you start to judge that, you know, and wow, they just don't have as much information as I do, right? It might be Republicans and Democrats looking, that never happens, right? That never happens. You know, looking down on, on another person because of that type of decision making. The more you grow and the more you mature in Christ, the more comfortable you should become in the areas of our lives that we should give each other freedom, and release others from the kind of bondage that we'd put on them. Not, not the kind of truth that God lays on all of us, but the kind of bondage that I would put others under because I have preferences. We give each other freedom to personally discern what's right and wrong, as the scriptures teach. That spirituality is, is, li is, is, is totally related to our relationship with Jesus Christ, and he's enough. Paul says in Colossians 2, don't settle for less. Don't settle for Jesus plus some lifestyle. 
Don't settle for Jesus plus some worship style. Don't settle for Jesus plus, uh, plus some experience that you're longing for that you haven't had lately. Don't, don't settle for Jesus plus certain rules that have to be followed so that we can all be on the same page. Then he summarizes it this way in verse 17. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You know what that means? That means that the bottom line is whatever it is that you're putting in the plus column with Jesus, it's probably not going to have the effect you think it is in restraining your sin. There's only one who can do anything with your sin. You know who that is? That's Jesus. So don't settle for something else. I love how Paul describes Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. Listen to this. Just listen to how he lays out the all-sufficiency of Jesus. Listen to this. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. In him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the glue that holds us together, this whole universe, everything in it. He's the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. It's him. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. That's us. Whether things on heaven, things on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He's enough. He's enough. He's everything you need. He's more than you need. So don't settle for anything less and don't add anything more. Don't let anything, don't let anyone take you captive. I have a friend who 20 plus years ago came to Third City looking for Jesus. Now my friend had been in a, a religious system in his, for his whole life. He, he was a he was an, an avid churchgoer. He attended this church that was very rigid, very legalistic. It was a Sabbath worshiping church. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in itself. The church chooses to have their primary service on Saturday, so be it. Nothing wrong with that. But in this case, it was a very dominating, very strict church many special rules about how you could dress or couldn't dress, about how you worshipped or how you shouldn't worship, about what you could eat, what you could not, what you should not eat, what you could drink, what you could not, all that stuff. Don't even try to dance in that church. It's not going to happen. All these rituals. Then he discovered that Jesus is enough. And that's how we got acquainted, basically. And so he started coming to Third Secret Church and, you know, his, his family. And uh, he told me that this happened. So, I don't know, maybe a month after he left that cult, um, the elders of that cult showed up on his doorstep. And they wanted to warn him that he was going to go to hell because he was leaving the cult. And I don't know what you would have done with that. I probably would have said, hey, I don't want to talk to you guys. I've made my choice. Thank you very much. You're out of here. I don't know. I don't know what I've done. I love what he did. He said, hey, guys, come on in. He got him a glass of tea or a cup of coffee or something. No, not a cup of coffee. They wouldn't drink coffee. Never mind. None of that. Water. He got him some water. And and he said, he said, guys, I think you're here for a reason. The reason is this. I need to tell you. Jesus is enough. His grace is sufficient for me. And and all this stuff you're doing, 
to try to please God and be religious, it's all a waste. That's what he did. I thought that was great. My friend, basking in grace, invited them to grace. Jesus is enough. Some of you, the reason that you're rejecting God is because you've been led to believe it's Jesus plus. And, and maybe what you need to do is just to set, push the reset button and say, you know what, I'm going to just start with Jesus. Because believe me, if you just start with Jesus, that's all you'll ever need. And so if we can help you with that, that's why we're here. Maybe you're placing your faith, wrapping your life around something that's not going to fill your bucket. It might be a career that, though it's important to you, it's not the most important thing in your life. Maybe it's your financial status, which is important, but not shouldn't be the most important thing. Maybe it's the religious efforts you're involved with. I don't know. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's Jesus not plus Jesus in religion, religion. It's, it's Jesus. Just as you've received Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue, continue, continue to live your life in him, rooted and built in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. That's Jesus. So if you want to replace the lesser things with the, with the real thing, that's why we're here. And so we would love to have a conversation with you. Maybe you're ready just to say, Lord, I've been trying everything else. I'm going to come back to you. It's you first. And if you're making that decision today, we'd love to talk to you. Just stop at the hub when you're leaving and say, I'm ready to put Jesus first and tell me what I need to do next to, to make that step. Maybe for you, it's like you've, you're coming from another religion or another church and you've had enough of the rules and regulations that don't matter anymore. And you're saying, I just want something real. And look, we're not perfect here. But you know what? We're going to love you. And we're going to help you work through whatever you have to work through to put Jesus first. That's why we're here. So again, stop out at the hub and let us know you're ready for that. So Lord, we come to you in this time of service where we're now going to open up a table. A table that, that explains in a very clear way what it costs you to love us. How you came into our world, died on a cross, and was raised from the dead giving us hope that our lives can have meaning now because of you. That's a relationship that you founded, not a religion you started. And so, Lord, we celebrate that today at this table as we take the bread and the cup and we remember that you love us that much and the price you paid for that to take our sins away, to give us eternity. So, Lord, we celebrate that. Then we're going to give, those of us who are able to, we're going to do so out of gratefulness and generosity because you're a God who deserves everything that we can give back. And so, Lord, thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can worship you in spirit and truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray.